Uh, let's take our Bibles and, and turn to chapter 8 of the Gospel by John. Uh, I'm so thankful. In fact, my uh, 18-year-old graduated last night, and my 16-year-old turned 16 at midnight last night. Uh, we were driving up here, and uh, Jeremiah said, am I 16 yet? I said, nope, it's quarter to 12. Uh, you're not. Uh, I think he wanted to drive. Uh, but uh, uh, it, it was wonderful to, to celebrate uh, such a milestone. But these five sessions, I would like to share with you, and I wrote it down, the prayer that changes me, now listen, into living for what pleases God. Now, all of us have a diminishing amount of uh, remembrance. So I'm going to tell you right up front everything you need to remember for the whole weekend. And you can zone out. You can go into fishing in your mind. You can go into lunch. You can start thinking about what it's going to be like when it rains and, you know, all that stuff. But there are only two choices in life, pleasing God or pleasing myself. We were born hardwired for this one. We were born to please ourselves. In fact, that's why I walked in the picture in 1965. All those men had golden shovels, and I wanted to see if they were real gold. You know, they were spray painted, but I didn't know, and I just walked right up to look at them right when the photographer snapped the picture. And it was just kind of like we always, Isaiah put it this way. You might know this verse. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to what? Yeah. We are hardwired to, just like your telephone at home, if you still have one that has a cord, it's hardwired. I mean, it just, it's, it's, you can't walk around with it very far. It's connected and it's always, and you know what God says, we're connected to wanting our own way. And so instead of being discouraged about that, the Lord told us that that's the opportunity for us to make a choice every day to either please ourselves, which if we're not, if we don't even think about what we're doing, we, we gravitate toward that. In fact, let me just give you a little test. If someone shows you a picture, you know, they, they, they get a picture and they hand it to you, who do you usually look for first in the picture? Come on, honestly. Yeah, we see if we're in the picture. If we're not, we give it. We say, "What was that for?" You know, uh, you know. If if you're going to school or in a competition, fishing, hunting, you're in academic competition, and they post the winners, whose name do you look for on the list? Yeah, I mean, see, that's just if we don't think about it. That's our first inclination. So we have a choice every day, either without thinking, we gravitate toward pleasing self. And and we immediately start making our assessment of the day by whether we feel good, whether we slept well, whether we got what we wanted to eat. You understand what I mean? I mean, it's just, you know, whether we got a good parking place and, and all of those things. And that's just, that is just life. Natural life. Yeah, the... Paul calls it the natural man desires the things for himself. The other choice is pleasing God. And you know what? It is a conscious effort to, to say, I am not going to decide what, what life, you know, the, the basic essence of life is, is surrounding me. I am going to choose to please God. Now, look at John chapter 8, because I want you to know you're in good company. Christ's life goal was to please God. And where I'm getting to is this prayer that we're going to study, the five sessions, is the simplest way I've ever seen in my life. In fact, I've spent a whole year studying this prayer. It's the sim- I'm trying to figure out how the early church did it. You know the early church, the book of Acts church? How did they do it? How did they do what Jesus did? Look at chapter 8, verse 29. And he who sent me is with me. The Father has not left me alone. Now look at this. This is Christ's purpose, goal, direction of life. He said, for I always do those things that what? Please him. Jesus was 100% human. I think all of us are this morning. You know what I mean? Aren't you all 100% human? We don't have any um, Klingons or shows how old I am. I don't even know the new science fiction terms. Uh, uh, 
I think we're all human, 100%. Jesus, the book of Hebrews says, suffered every temptation that we face. Now there's one that I still don't quite understand. I go, really? It bothered you? You didn't have sugar in your coffee? Uh, You know, that, that it was fake cream? You know, they call that stuff cream. It's not cream. It's white coloring. You know, I like, re- I like it the way God made it out of the cow, you know. Uh, so that Jesus suffered everything we suffer, yes. In fact, his three temptations from the devil, if you look at it, encompass every temptation humans have. The first one, turn the rocks into bread, satisfy a legitimate desire in an illegitimate way. There's the biggest temptation every human goes through. Satisfy a legitimate desire. Talk about the number one desire that the New Testament says we struggle with. The number one sin is immorality in all of its various forms. Do you know what immorality is? Trying to satisfy a legitimate desire God put inside of us. Sexual desire in an illegitimate way. Jesus was tempted to satisfy a legitimate desire in an illegitimate way. And so that his legitimate desire was hunger, and the illegitimate way was to go and turn rocks into bread. He could do it, but he wouldn't. You see, Jesus is 100% human. And Jesus, look back at verse 29 of chapter 8, and I actually wrote in my Bible, Christ's life's goal was to please God. Now, I would encourage you, if you have any way of, and you don't think it's sacrosanct or, uh, you know, bad to write in your Bible. I've met people, they, they actually shudder when you write in your Bible because they think you're adding to the Word of God. And I said, no, I'm not. I'm trying to remember what I read. But if you're able to write in your Bible, I would write that Christ's life goal is right there and circle that, that, that verse that is in every one of the main versions. I checked it. All of them, New King James and King James and NIV and NAS and ESV, have this concept of pleasing God. Jesus' life goal was to please God. Jesus didn't operate independent of his Father. Now you say, wait a minute, I thought it was one God. It is one God in three persons. One God eternally existing in three persons. And the person of the Son said, I choose to always do what my Father wants me to do. I don't do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. So Jesus, number one, if you're a note taker, this is the fifth time I'm saying it, Christ's life goal was to please God. And notice what he says, for the last phrase, for I always do. Now there's the difference between Jesus and me. I don't. Do you always do what the Father wants you to do? Mm-mm. Now we will when we're glorified. You know what glorification is? That's when the, the sinful flesh old us that we struggle with all the way through life gets taken away. Now that, that's what the hymn writers talk about, that will be glory for me. When by his grace I shall look upon his face, oh, that will be glory for me. Because we will be glorified. Every time my mother used to serve glorified rice, I used to think, does that mean, you know, when I was little, I was trying to figure out doctrine. You ever heard of glorified rice? I think it has whipped cream in it or something, you know, and it... it, uh, and when they use Cool Whip, it tastes greasy. You know, I just remember that. But uh, I thought, Ugh, so when I get to heaven, I'm going to taste greasy. You know, um, when we're glorified, we will. Verse 29, right at the end, I always do those things that please Him. That's in heaven. Do you know what earth is? The choice every day we make, every hour, and every moment. To consciously switch from our our hardwired default setting of pleasing ourselves, when we decide that we're going to please God, that instantly glorifies Him. You want to know how to have a life that glorifies the Lord? You don't have to go to Yemen and be martyred to please the Lord. Okay? And you don't even have to go to Mexico and preach in the slums to, to please the Lord. You know what you can do? You can do it at your job or not having a job. I forgot, you know, Michigan's the most unemployed state. No, Nevada just passed us. Okay, we're second. Uh, 
It doesn't matter what we do. We can please God in everything that we consciously say, Lord, I don't want to do my own thing today. I want to do your will. That glorifies God. So I, what I said is right up front, I'm, I'm just going to enlarge on that idea all week long. Everything comes down. When you leave this building going to lunch, you can choose to leave this building in a way that pleases God or not. A way that pleases God would be to look on the things of others more than the things of yourself. It would be to think about what will magnify Him, what will cause His Word to to be richly dwelling in my life. Did you know most of us don't think about that? Most of us, it's almost like compartments. It's almost like folders on your computer. It's almost like, like wherever you have a filing cabinet. We have the God Church Bible thing, and, and okay, we got the service. All that stuff goes in there, but boy, we leave it there. You know what? It's supposed to permeate our lives. Christ is. Pleasing God is. It's supposed to be a part of how we go to school. I remember when I was here, when I was a camper, oh, that was a long time ago, and I don't even remember the guy's name, but but he harped. You know, I was a camper, a little guy, and he harped and harped and harped, the, the speaker, about the Bible and how important it was and, and I remember he said, don't put it on the floor. You know, we'd, you know, we'd put our, don't put it on the floor and all that. And I mean, you know, he had a lot of things. But you know what he, he got through to me? What I remember was, when I was in junior high, he said, the test of your willingness to serve the Lord, now this was his challenge to us campers all week, is whether or not you'll start taking your Bible to school. I went to Hazlitt Public Schools way back in the 60s and the 70s. And I thought, oh, ride the bus and carry that thing all day long. You know, I already had that many books. So I put it in, but I put it in down there, you know. And I got on the bus and some eagle eye went, what's that? Is that a Bible? And pretty soon everybody on the bus. Bible! I mean, it was just the bus. Do you remember? Any of you ride the bus? Any of you? Come on. How many of you rode the yellow bus? You know what it was like. I mean, the bus driver would slam on the brakes and say, if you guys don't, you know, I want to... And, and he hit the brakes to make all of us... Sh- I mean, it was very exciting back then, before they had all the rules they have nowadays, you know. And I remember it became a conscious choice whether I was going to hide this thing. I mean, what you have to do is you have to turn this part out so they couldn't... Then they could tell it was a Bible because there are few books that even look like this. But finally, it moved to the top of my stack. And finally, I started reading it at lunch hour while everyone was having French fry fights. They would throw French fries at each other in the Hazlitt cafeteria. And I sat over there, and, and about the third day, someone came over, and they sat down, and they went, I'm going to read my Bible with you. I'm a Christian too. I saw you reading it. I knew I should. And before the end of the school year, there were 60 of us carrying our Bibles. Now, that's not a fetish, and it wasn't some good luck charm, and it didn't make us go to heaven and get more points. What it was is we had a choice. Either we could be mindlessly showing off and throwing French fries or accomplishing something. And we started a Bible study club, and that year, two boys in the club got saved. And one of them, pastors now south of uh, Battle Creek, and the other one, pastors in the Upper Peninsula. They never left Michigan. They got saved in the French fry fight Bible study. And you know what? We would start reading our Bibles just in a group, and then we all just shared before lunch half hour, however long was over, what we found. Did you know that was a simple way of converting that time? And do you know to this, well, not to this day because he's gone now, but my principal, until I was in my 40s, the principal of Hazlitt High School, when he would see me in Hazlitt, he'd say, there's the deacon. That's what he called me. He was Catholic, and Roman Catholic really good people were deacons that were lay people, not priests. 
He called me one of those. Well, all that to say this, there's a choice to please God. Now, turn with me to a second one. I want you to look at Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Uh, what was the first point? What does John eight twenty nine tell us? Anybody write it down? Yep. And my challenge to you before this day is over is, have you made it your life goal? How about just making it today goal to please God? How about just make it for one minute? You know what I mean? We should start in a, in a, in a manageable way and just say, like Christ, I want, to, I want to experience pleasing God right now. Now, what happens when we don't make that choice? Look at Romans chapter 8 and verse 8. Point number two, only spirit-prompted lifestyles can please God. In other words, it isn't how hard I try. It isn't me saying, boy, I'm going to try my hardest to be a good husband. I'm going to try my hardest to be a good dad. I'm going to try my hardest to be a good you know, servant of my Lord in my church. It isn't human effort. Look at what Romans chapter 8, verse 8 says. And I, again, I, I wrote that right next to that in my Bible. Spirit prompted lifestyle of pleasing God. It's to remind myself that I can try my hardest and crank this out on my own. Do you know how I know when I'm cranking it out? I get weary of doing it. I get discouraged. When, when, it's, when it's self-prompted, it wears out. When it's spirit-prompted, it's spirit-prompted. See what he says? So then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. God is not pleased when I am trying my hardest and, and squeezing it out. And I'm going to please God my way. You know, it's just like what Jesus said if we were back in John, John chapter 4. Jesus said that, that the worship God wants is worship that is worship in spirit and in truth. The prompting is the Holy Spirit. And the direction and, and content of the worship is truth. And God is only pleased by worship that is prompted by His Spirit and is based on truth. And the same is true with our lifestyles. God wants us to have pleasing God desires, but He wants it prompted by the Holy Spirit. You know what that means? That means that we have... That's why this prayer that, that I'm going to show you is so important. Because the prayer is an invitation for the Lord to control us, to empower us, to empty us, to keep us so clean that, that the Spirit of God can work through us. So Romans 8 and verse 8 says, Only Spirit-prompted lifestyles can please God. The rest is fleshly. And look what it says in verse 8. It, it says, Not please God. It's displeasing to God. Did you know that, that every day, my choices that I make in life are, are brought before the presence of God, it's like my whole life is, uh, you ever seen one of those central vacuum cleaners? Uh, they're like a big canister. You probably have one in your house. They're just like this big thing. And all these tubes come through the walls, and it goes to that. And all the dirt and Legos and, you know what I mean, um, everything that's around that's swept up, all goes into there, and it just, Dad has to empty it. I have more fun emptying that thing. I love to see what's in there. You know, it's just, uh, and I love to hear it go. I remember my son was in the basement. He didn't ever know what all those tubes were. And one of the other kids was sweeping, and he said, Dad, something just went all the way through the basement. And I said, yeah, that's the central vac. He says, what's the central vac? I said, when you put that tube in the wall, it goes to the garage. Never knew that. But that tube entering that tank is much like what the throne of God is like. Did you know everything in my life and yours, God is sucking up and it's coming in front of him and it's pouring out. And the Bible tells us he sorts it into two piles. God only has two settings. Pleases me, doesn't please me. Pleases me, pleases me, pleases me, please. Ooh, doesn't, doesn't, doesn't. 
And look what it says in chapter 8, verse 8. When we are in the flesh, Galatians 5 tells us what the works of the flesh are, anger, wrath, malice, evil communication, clamor. When, when we are slandering, when we are gossiping, when we are harshly speaking, when we are Ephesians 4, speaking in a cutting way, when, when our communication slices people, it's so sharp and it's so so deadly. James says that our tongues are a deadly fire that can consume people. I mean, you read in the news the different people that have committed suicide because they were so vilified and hurt in college, you know, or in high school, or so they they were so smitten by people's words that they ended their own lives. It's amazing. When we're in the flesh, that's what we act like, and that doesn't please God. Okay, point number one, Christ's life goal was to please God. Point number two, only spirit-prompted lifestyles can please God. Now, real quickly, I want to take you to the epistles. I want to show you how Paul applied this. Look at Philippians 2.13. Philippians 2.13. Third point, the surrender to God's control pleases God. And that's why when we go through the Lord's Prayer, I'm going to talk about that the essence of the Lord's Prayer is when we say, Thy kingdom come. Martin Luther, you know Martin Luther, the the great reformer, he used to call this the terrible prayer. The Lord's Prayer was the terrible prayer. Do you know why? Because we say to God, Your kingdom come. You know what that, if you understand the, the, the force of the Greek language, it was saying, Occupy. Control, take me over. And he said, that's terrible. He said, it's terrible for a Christian to tell God, I'm yours, take me over. And then to operate their own way. It is so offensive. It's kind of like renting a car from Hertz and and they don't give you the keys. Wouldn't that bother you if you rented a car at the airport and they wouldn't give you the keys? They said, well, you rented it. There it is. Yeah, but I want the keys. I want to drive it. No. It's just there. Sit in it, you know. And look at the countryside from the airport parking lot. You know, wouldn't that bother you? I mean, how would you like to go to Walmart and buy something, and on the way out the door, they take it away from you? You go, well, I thought I bought it. It's mine. God says, I bought you at a price. You're supposed to glorify me. What do you, you took the keys back. You're not doing what I want you to do. Now look at Philippians 2.13. This is what, how Paul, and real quickly I want to show you this, because Paul is the best applier of this truth. Philippians 2.13 For it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. And when we do that, look at verse 14. We do all things without complaining and disputing. So we can become blameless and harmless, the children of God without fault, in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom we shine as lights in the world. And we hold fast the word of life. But it all starts in verse 13. For it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. Do you understand this this weekend, these, these little sessions we have are all about whether or not we are going to consciously surrender to pleasing ourselves, which we're really good at. Or if we're going to start saying, God, by your grace and through the power of your spirit, I once again want to step before you and say, Father in heaven, I, I know how great you are. And I ask you to let your kingdom come into my life. I want you to control me today. And Lord, I want to do your will today. You know, the, the greatest privilege that, that we could have is to, to remember this Memorial Day weekend is a weekend that we each got serious about stepping into that place stepping onto that altar, stepping into that circle where we say, God, you are in control, and I want, I want you to know I am standing in front of you, and I want you to control me today. You know, I'm afraid of this. I, I fear at my job. I fear at school. I fear in my neighborhood. I fear what people think. I, I'm, I'm so concerned about whether I'm going to have enough whatever to last for however how long. And, Lord, I want you to control me and take over my fears and my desires and my anxieties. Or I have these out-of-control desires. I have such desires I want to fulfill them in an illegitimate way. And Lord, I've been, that's how I've been my whole life. 
Lord, I want you to control me. And you know what? Paul said this. It's God who works in to will and to do for his good pleasure. All we have to do is surrender to him. And it doesn't matter if you surrender to him and unsurrender to him. The Lord is the God of the second chance and the third chance and the fourth chance. Do you remember what he said to Peter? He says, forgive him 70 times 7. What that means is, if, if humans are supposed to be that forgiving, can you imagine how forgiving God is? God says, I will forgive you and save you to the uttermost. I have lovingly chosen to pour out my love on you so that I will love you to the uttermost, no matter how many times you fail. No matter how many times I fail the Lord, every time I confess and agree with Him that I failed, He, on the basis of His character, is faithful and just. The Greek language says, to already have forgiven me. Jesus already forgave me once and for all. It's not like i got to beg Him for Him to dole out one more squirt of forgiveness. He's already forgiven me for everything, forever. Real quickly, go to Colossians 1.10, because uh, I want you to see it's a repeated theme that Paul has, and you probably have uh, noticed this in that prayer. Paul is praying uh, in verse 9. He says, we, we pray for you. We ask you to be filled with the knowledge of his will. Look at verse 10. This was Paul's prayer, that you may walk worthy of the Lord. What does the next line say? Yeah, fully pleasing to him. There's that same idea. Did you know there's only two choices in life, pleasing God or pleasing myself? And Paul says, I pray that you will be fully pleasing to Him, being fruitful in every good work. So what pleases God when I'm fruitful in what He wants me to do? When I increase in the knowledge of God. What is the knowledge of God? The knowledge of God is experientially knowing, experiencing God. That's, that's what the knowledge is. It's not head knowledge. It's not saying, yep, another fact, I can win Bible trivia. You know, it's saying, I want to apply that to my life. I, I'm having more fun these days. I'm leading a study. I call it 12 by 12 by 12 at, at Calvary. And it's the 12 Bible study methods. And I pick 12 men, and we're studying them for 12 months. So that's 12 by 12 by 12. Actually, I wanted 12, and I got 65. So it's okay. It's 65 by 12 by 12. It doesn't matter. But um, I told him, I said, this, th- these are the 12 methods of Bible study. The first one is a devotional method. The devotional method is you read a, any size portion of the Bible and you summarize it. You say, Psalm 23, David is talking about God, that God is a shepherd. I mean, anything, any summary, it's whatever you think is in there. That's, that's the first thing you do. And most men had never done that. I mean, it was revolutionary for them to actually write something down after reading their Bible. They came, they were so excited, and they wrote something down. They said, what's the next thing? I said, well, the second part of devotional study is that you have, to, you have to find out of that passage a truth about God. Well, the Lord is my shepherd. I show, that David saw God in a very personal way. Good, there's a truth about God. David saw God in a personal way. David said, God is my shepherd. So we took him to the 23rd Psalm. And most of them, we got all done. They were so happy, they went, I said, oh, oh, no, no. That's where all Americans quit in their Bible study. I said, there's one more level you, ha- you can't miss. You read the passage, praise the Lord. Reading the Bible is good. You summarize and find truths. Praise the Lord. Most people don't even go that far. Do you know what the ultimate step is that most believers never do? Apply, well, memorize, yes, but, but apply it to my life. Did you know we're not wired that way? When we read the Bible, we find a great verse for our wife. You know, or, boy, the kids, those kids need to see that. Or... Oh, the guys at work. Or those women, you know, that, that aren't as hard a working wife as I am. You know, they need to read that. But you know what we are impervious to? Seeing that it's us. Did you know when I read the Bible, the very first and most important thing is for, not for me to find everything that, that you need to get out of there. It's for me to apply it to my life. And so when I read the 23rd Psalm, I have to say, Lord, I want you to be my shepherd immediately. Do you know what that means? It means a shepherd is someone that a sheep follows. A sheep knows the voice of their shepherd. And so I want to, I want to follow you, Lord, is what that's saying, if I apply it to my life. I want to hear your voice. How do you hear the voice of the Lord? I heard, I heard Jesus talking this morning. 
He was talking on the second floor of the trading post. Did you hear him talking in the campground? This is called the what of God? Word. Words are when people what? Communicate, either verbally or non-verbally. When you open this book up and ask God to, to speak to you through his word, when you read this book, you're hearing in your spirit and soul the voice of God. You know, last year, John Piper, you know John Piper, right? Uh, you all heard of John Piper, uh, phenomenal theologian. Last year he sent out an email and he said, I'm, I am sitting in the northern parts of Minnesota, total frozen, sparkling lights. He says, I'm, I'm sitting in a rocking chair, he said, by a fireplace. And he said, all of a sudden, I heard a voice coming from, and he went on and on. People got unglued. They thought he'd become, you know, one of these hearing voices people. And you know what his whole email was about? He was reading the Bible and God was speaking through his word to him. Look at Colossians 1.10. That you might walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work, increasing in the knowledge of God. How do we do that? We do that by hearing his voice and allowing him to speak to our heart and letting him apply it to our lives. Did you know that if, if you are dedicated to this concept of letting God speak through His Word, you, you read a portion of the Word of God, any size, it doesn't matter if you read a book, a chapter, or a verse, or a phrase, and you say from that phrase, here's a truth about God, and then you pause and say, and now I'm going to apply that to my life, that Lord, I need to not go too long between hearing Your voice. You know, the average... Uh, Teenager texts, is it 30 times a day or 300? I don't know. It's, I mean, New York Times said it's unbelievable how often they text. And when they're not texting, they're what? Facebooking, right? Uh, it's unbelievable. And what is it? They don't want to ever be out of touch. I mean, they just, it's getting so employees. They, they can't stop being connected. Did you know that's a beautiful picture of this? This, this? this is the cell phone to God. This is the Facebook. The face of God in this book is how I know what pleases Him. And Paul said, my prayer is, verse 10, that you'd walk worthy of the Lord And fully please Him. And by the way, he's written down what pleases Him and what doesn't please Him right here. It's no mystery. It's not based on your denomination. It's not based on my church says. It's God says. You know, it was really interesting. The visitor line at Calvary, we have this wonderful little reception that somebody put together. And and, I always tell them on Sunday, I always say, if I've never met you personally, I'd like to meet you. And I said, and so far I've met 584 of you, you know, because I write down every time I meet one and ask them something I can pray for. And so this whole crew came through on Sunday, and one of them walked through the line, and they said, they said, do you, did you say this morning, and they, they repeated something, I said, do you mean you, you think I should do that in my life? I said, oh, no, no, I didn't I, I didn't say I think you should do that. They relaxed and they said, oh, it's so good. I thought you said, you know, that, that you shouldn't allow your children to watch occultic movies. They said, I'm so glad you said that, 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 you, didn't, that you didn't say that. I said, no, I didn't. God did. <laughs> they looked at me and they said, you mean... You're, you're still saying I said, no, I'm not still saying it. I said, God said that you should not have anything to do with the occult. And I said, for you to allow your children to fill their minds with occultic things is, is displeasing to God that you as a parent would allow them to do that. They said, now you're saying it again. I said, no, I'm not. I'm repeating what he said. And, you know, they went around and finally they caught it. And they said, so what you're telling me is you're not saying that. That it's, and I opened the Bible and I showed them. And they went, 
Oh, that's different. I said, yeah, it is. Now it comes down to the, the central vac. What is pouring out in front of God from your life? Are you pouring out stuff that displeases him or what pleases him? Next reference, real quickly, look at 1 Thessalonians. And this is the last one before we get into the Lord's Prayer. Go to the right in your Bible. You know, you're in Philippians and you're in Colossians. Now look at 1 Thessalonians. This is Paul's first epistle, by the way. You know that. Not the first epistle of the New Testament. That's James. But the first epistle Paul probably wrote is 1 Thessalonians very early on. Now some say it could be Galatians. I don't. doesn't matter. It could be Galatians. Probably was 1 Thessalonians. But what we do know is that Paul wrote 1 Thessalonians to a group of people. They lived in Thessalonica, which is the second largest city still today in Greece. You know Greece, the one they're defaulting on their bond? Did you know if Greece defaults, the Lehman collapse of 08 is going to just be like it was nothing? It's going to be kind of like a thunderstorm compared to what hit Joplin. If Greece defaults on their sovereign debt, it's going to change the whole world's economy. It's going to be unbelievable. So you guys should watch the news. Greece is getting very close to defaulting. A country telling the world they're not going to pay their money back. The, a systemic default. Unbelievable. All the people that really understand global finance are just shuddering at the implications. Because then Portugal will default. And then Ireland will default. Italy is downgraded. And we're going to have something that could line up to be a realignment of global money. Wouldn't that be a great time for someone to say, hey, I've got a solution. Can you imagine? They'd solve the whole world's financial problems, and they'll say, by the way, I'll solve all the terrorism. Why don't you just elect me to run the world? Can't you see that coming? Uh, everyone's money gets their attention. But Paul is to this Greek city. Look at chapter 4, verse 1. And this is Paul summarizing his whole ministry. If you read, remember, uh, the book of Acts, chapter 17, tells us Paul is uh, coming from Philippi where he got beaten, uh, you know, and he walks after being beaten in chapter 16. He walks 97 miles south to Thessalonica. And he got there with his back totally raw from being beaten with 40 lashes by the Romans and all that stuff. And he comes and he stays three weeks ministering to them. And look what he says in 1 Thessalonians 4.1. Finally then, brethren, we urge and exhort in the Lord Jesus that you should abound more and more just as you receive from us. What has he said so far? He's building up to something. If you notice the, the word order, we're urging, we're exhorting that you should abound more and more just as you receive from us how you ought to walk and to what? Did you know Paul reduced down the entire Christian life? They didn't need a gigantic notebook, and they didn't need a, a, to buy this huge book. He said, if you want to understand the whole Christian life, you ought to, what does it say at the end of verse 1? Chapter 4, verse 1. What does it say we're supposed to do? All versions have the same words. We ought to what? Yeah, walk in a way that pleases God. Emphasis on pleasing God. Do you know what pleasing is? If you like someone, you're checking out what you can do that would please them. You, you kind of watch them. You see what they like. You see what they don't like. If you want to be their friend, you don't pester them constantly with what they don't like. You don't bother them. They will not be your friend if you do that. You learn what they like. And, and you try and, as much as possible, do those things that don't offend them, that don't irritate them, that don't aggravate them, and that go beyond that. Instead of just that, all that negative, you go beyond that. It's kind of like the guys that are in the dating mode, you know. You ever seen a guy, when he finds this girl, that, I mean, he goes crazy, he ch starts shaving? I mean, he used to look like Woody Woodsman, you know. Starts combing his hair, starts smelling nice. Uh, he runs around, and, and I mean, he just he opens the door. I mean, whatever. Where's cologne? Buys presents for the girl. Then he gets married, goes back to Woody Woodsman, you know, right? I always tell men, I say, you know what? You should work as hard to keep her as you did to get her. You know? The Christian life is the same way. When we become captivated by Christ, we want to do everything possible to please Him. So look back at 1 Thessalonians 4.1. Paul summarizes 
his teaching to the believers in his probably first epistle, that he taught them how to please God. So it's not, don't do this, don't do that. It isn't just a list of don'ts and do's. It's, this does not please God. So if you love him, what will you do? You'll get away from those things. This pleases God. And if you love him, what will you do? You'll gravitate toward those things. Did you know that every time I'm reading the Bible, what I'm doing is, I am listening to God. I mean, I can actually hear him talking. And he's saying, those things grieve my spirit. Those things quench my spirit. And because I love him, I go, whoa. I want to be as far away from that stuff as possible. And the Lord says, this pleases me. And I go, oh, Lord strengthen me, empower me. That's what I want with my life. You see, the Christian life is simple. Not easy. Simple. The simple essence of our life as a Christian is we have two choices that are on the shelf in front of us. Pleasing God. Pleasing self. No one needs to tell us how to please self, because we are hardwired that way. The pleasing God part is right there. Now, you know what? You can do a little test right now. I can tell you where you are spiritually. You can do a self-spiritual exam right now. If this, what do I have on my hand? The Bible. The Bible is the Word of God, and it's God telling us what pleases Him. If, if that is the total source of the truth of what pleases God. There, there is, this is the once and for all, settled in heaven, word of God. And this same thing is going to be in heaven. It's once and for all, settled in heaven. God really thinks this is an important thing. And we are going to not just uh, leave it behind. It's going to be in heaven. It's an eternal record. If this is what pleases God, have you ever read the whole thing? I mean, right now, this is a rhetorical question, okay? Don't blurt it out, you know. If this contains everything that pleases God, have you ever read all of it? Do you know how long it takes to read the Bible? Guess. 72 hours. How long is one football game? Blurt it out. Three hours. 24 football games, okay? How long is a basketball game? Hour and a half. So, uh, are, is that a fast one? I'm sports challenged, okay. Um, you know what I mean. How long is a, as in anything, it only takes, how long does it take to read the Bible? You know who told me that? Billy Graham. I heard him say that in the crusade. He has it in his books. He said, for a sixth grader, if you read at a sixth grade level, it takes 72 hours if you don't pause, if you just read continuously. And not go, Mephibosheth, wonder what that means. That's bogging yourself down. Just read it. 72 hours, okay? Now, let me ask you this. Have you ever read the whole Bible? Don't answer out loud. Just think it. Number two, have you ever not only read it, but paused after you got done reading it, and wrote down a truth that's in that passage. Number three, have you ever said, Lord, I want to apply that to my life. That displeases you, I don't want to do it. That's an application. That pleases you, I want by your grace and the power of your spirit. I want that in my life, Lord. Can you hear me? That's what I want. I want the wisdom that's from above that's first pure and peaceable and gentle and easily entreated and full of mercy and good fruits without partiality, without hypocrisy. I want that in my life. Did you know that's what Bible reading is all about? Bible reading is not to, to impress people. It's to please God. And it's to know how to avoid what displeases God. Now, real quickly, let me take you through this and then we have to go to lunch. We only have about a minute. There we go. The prayer that changes me following Christ's command. Now, think about this for a second. 
this is the first command in the book of Matthew that Jesus applies to the disciples. Uh, for, for a moment, you're going to have to really think fast because uh, uh, we don't want to be late to lunch. Okay. Do y'all, y'all heard of the Great Commission, right? Uh, go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, right? Teaching them to observe all things that I have what? Say it louder. Yeah, commanded you. What has Jesus commanded? Well, it's very easy to know what Jesus has commanded because in the Greek language, a command is always in the imperative mode, and the imperative mode is an ending that is added to the end of a word, and it's always, that A-T-E ending, is always imperative. They didn't make imperatives in Greek by raising their voices. They just put an ending on the word, and it meant command. So Jesus, Jesus said we're supposed to teach believers what he commanded. Matthew 6 and verse 9 has the very first imperative for believers that's given in the New Testament. Now, there are many imperatives before that, like, uh, you know, don't do this, don't do that, but they're generic. Now Jesus said, after this manner, I command you to pray. And, and he starts giving them this beautiful lesson, and it has seven parts. Our Father who art in heaven, We're supposed to say, Lord, focus me on who you are as God. We're going to do that, Lord willing, tonight. In this manner, therefore, now in this manner means following this pattern. It doesn't mean repeat mindlessly. You know, you can go to to a lot of liturgical churches, and people can, they know the order of the service, and they can do the Gloria Patria and the doxology and the Lord's Prayer and the response and da-da-da-da. No, no. Don't repeat these words. Follow this pattern. This word pray right there, and I guess I have a pointer, that word right there is an imperative. I command you, pray in this manner. And the first part is, we're supposed to focus. We're not supposed to repeat these words, our Father in heaven, hallowed be their name. Because it doesn't mean anything. We just blah, blah, blah. Focus me on who you are as God. That I am supposed to reverence your name. And we'll talk about that tonight. Number two, control me because you have a plan for my life. Your kingdom come. That, that is what Luther said is the most terrible statement in the Bible. He says to come before the God of the universe sitting on his throne who is omnipotent. That means has all power. Omnipresent. That means he, he's everywhere we are. And he's omniscient. He knows even our thoughts and our motivations and our fears and everything. And to come before him and say, I surrender to your control. And then to not let him control us? That is horrible. Why should we let him control us? Because he has a plan for my life. Do you know what the most exciting thing to do is to go through life knowing that you are specifically doing what God wants you to do. And my dad, the... the, used to bring me here for 55 years ago, started bringing me here. And before that, Uncle Johnny was my parents' pastor in Okemos, Michigan. He led my mother to the Lord and baptized my parents. I mean, we go way back. But did you know what prompted my dad? He worked for 46 years for General Motors, 46, in the same building in Lansing. Do you know what he did in his lunchbox every day? He had one of those black metal, the rounded top ones that have a thermos in there. Every day, my mother would pack his fried egg sandwich or whatever he had. Ugh, fried egg sandwich. Um, And my dad would, she had to leave his lunchbox open. And my dad would stuff in and squash his sandwich with the paperback book he was reading. He taught himself Greek. He taught himself Hebrew. I don't think my dad went past the eighth grade. But he worked at General Motors for 46 years. And, you know, the United Auto Workers made him have all these breaks. I mean, you were there for five minutes, you had a 10-minute break. And then you worked for five minutes, and you had a 20-minute break. I mean, my dad used to tell me about it. I mean, the, the union guys would patrol, say, oh, slow down, stop working so much. You're, you know, making the line go too fast. And, you know, my dad, of course, he worked there. He could tell those jokes. Did you know he had, my dad was a precise machining guy. He made this little device that was only this big, and he was really carefully he made those he had a whole pocket full of them and he would walk around and he would put them on the drinking fountain you know the drinking fountain is made to make a gentle arc of water like this 
You know, you push the button, you lean down there and push the button, and it just comes up like a gentle rainbow. But with my father's device stuck in there, which no one could see, it was so little, it jetted the thing so it would go right in your ear. (laughs) And my dad had a whole pocket full of those. He'd go all over on his brakes at General Motors, mandated by the UAW, and he would stick that in and he would lean on a press. And this guy would come sweating and he'd lean over and go right in his ear. And oh, they finally caught my dad that he was doing it. Okay, so my dad said, Lord, what a waste of time. What, what could I do at General Motors with all these brakes? And that's when he started buying the Moody Coal, Coal, Coal Portage. What does that mean, Coal Portage? Yeah, it's, it's books that, that you can take and bend. They're paperback. And he bought all of them. And he'd bend them and put them in his little lunchbox. And he would consume and study the Bible. And he became a gifted Bible teacher. He was an artist and everything. Why, why did he do that? Because he said, God, I'm at General Motors. I didn't get out of the eighth grade. And, and why should I waste my life squirting people in the ear when I can do something eternal? And, and what is your plan? And he started studying. And, he start, and, and one, of, one of the boys that came on his group was Paul. And look where Paul got. You know, way past the eighth grade. You know, you have a plan for my life. And so so we should say, Lord, I want your kingdom now. Lead me so I do your will. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. How is God's will done in heaven? It's done perfectly. So what I say is, Lord, I would like more and more of my day to be spent walking according to your plan for my life. I've already established I want you to control me. I mean, that is rock solid. But Lord, I get a million little choices, and I want your will, and I want to hear your still small voice. I want to, like someone mentioned, I want to memorize verses. Okay, we only got two minutes. Will you speed up? Yes, I will. Okay. Supply me so I can see your hand in my life. This this is the fourth petition. It's right in the middle of the prayer. It's the only thing about me. And it's it's a sandwich. It's it's after we get all focused on God controlled and doing his will that we say, Lord, supply me. Why does God want us to have daily bread? Most of us would like to have the lottery, right? We'd like to get it over with, have enough money for the end. God says, no, I want you to be needing me every day. I want you to depend on me so I can see your hand, God, in my life. That's why God keeps us poor, so we need him. Cleanse me so I keep your blessing on my life. See, the problem is if we get dirty... It's kind of like your iPhone. If, if you get it dirty, if, if you, the, the little ending thing, you can get that thing so it won't hook up. And it, it gets so it doesn't work. And the Lord says, if you don't keep clean, my blessings cannot keep pouring on your life because I am offended when you persist in sin. So forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. So we'll look at that. Protect me so I don't lose your power in my life. The Lord says, I know every temptation, I've gone through it, and I leave a lighted exit door. See our exit signs right there? You know what the Bible says? There is no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful who will always make an exit. God always makes an exit. When we sin, it's a choice. And he wants to deliver us from the evil one. Empty me, this is the end of the prayer, so you get all the credit for my life. Look at this. For yours is the kingdom. The power, the glory, forever. It's all about God. Okay? Here's my finale. This whole weekend, you can spend the rest of the time on the archery range, okay? Because the entire weekend is on this card. Look at this. Can you see how little this is? This is the entire, everything I'm going to say this whole weekend is right here. And and Paul has, they're free. And it's called, the prayer that changes me. Focus me, control me, lead me, supply me, cleanse me, protect me, and empty me. I brought one for every one of you families. There might be almost one for every adult. There's 150 of them, I think. Run by the trading post and get one of these. They're made to be this size. Look at this. They're the same size as a credit card. See? You can keep it in your wallet. And it's a perfect way to pray, either on a daily basis, Lord, control me. Lead me. Focus me on who you are. Or maybe one a day. Just, just work on that. That's the first thing I want to tell you. Pick those up from the bookstore. Number two, and this is my ending. 
When you come to a retreat like this, God knew providentially your schedule, camp's schedule, the message that he laid on my heart, and your schedule. And God providentially worked all that out for you to be here, and there's a reason. And, and I don't know what the reason is, but he does, and he wants to work in every one of our lives. And this is something that you need to think about. This could be the beginning of a period of intense spiritual growth for you. And what you do is take this camp experience home with you, either in one of those books, Paul said, or in electronic form. Over in the bookstore are five intense study modules. This is, this is an MP3, has 50 audio messages on there, 50 study guides that are just like the one I just taught from. And how much are you selling these for? Well, I don't know either. But uh, this, this one is everything Jesus said about the future in Matthew 24. Jesus preached an entire sermon. Remember what I just said about Greek default? It's coming. It's called What's Next for Planet Earth? This one is phenomenal. This is called How to Discipline Yourself for Godliness. There are seven spiritual disciplines. Most believers don't even know what they are. One of them is fasting. One of them is memorizing and meditating. One of them is prayer. One of them is learning to walk in the Spirit. That's a discipline. It's called Discipline Yourself for Godliness. This is what Paul held up. It's word-filled families. Did you know this is every verse in the Bible that talks about parenting, husbands, wives, and kids, and how they're supposed to interrelate biblically. Word-filled families. This one is fascinating. It's called Knowing God. It's a survey of every book of the Bible. Most people haven't not only read the Bible, they don't even know what each book is about. And it's a one a week. You just go through one book of the Bible every week, and you listen to this one-hour-long summary of it, and you can just download it on your MP3 player, your iPhone or whatever. And this one, probably my favorite one, this is called David's Spiritual Secret. Who's the most written about person in the Bible? There are more chapters, 141 to be exact, about David's life than anybody else in the Bible. He's the most written about human being in the Bible. David is the perfect model for how to live a life that pleases God. At the end of his life, the Lord said this, David fulfilled my purposes. Let's all stand, and as we stand, we're going to quote that prayer that we're going to start on tonight, and we're going to learn how to focus on God, but this is what I want you to do. You all know the words to it, and so you can just be creative. If you want to say the Lord's Prayer and look up, and, and, or you can close your eyes, or you can look down, but I want you to say it slowly with me, and I want you to offer it as our closing offering to the Lord. Let's pray it together. Our Father, who art in heaven... Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.